Well, welcome everyone. Hello, hello. I am so excited about today's webinar because I have a very special guest, Lainey Miller. So yes, welcome. Come on in. Say hello in the chat. I love seeing where everyone's from. We've got South Africa and Canada and Minnesota and oh, everywhere. So come on in. Welcome, welcome. We have an ex a very, very special program for you today. Um, and I, I'm so grateful Amy's here and able to take the time with everyone. I'll do a quick introduction on myself, then I'm going to tell you about Lainey. We'll do a few little logistics. So in case you don't know me, I'm Joan Burge. I'm founder and CEO of Office Dynamics International. And we are a global leader in the development and presentation of sophisticated training programs and information for administrative office professionals. And I'm happy to say we've been doing this for 30 years. <laughs> this is our 30 year celebration. Woo! I can't believe it. Um, so Lainey and I actually have known each other for years, right, Lainey? I think way, way back. I don't even remember how we first met. Um, and but Lainey and I have become especially close, I think, this past year, with everything happening with COVID, but also I had asked Lainey a year ago if she would speak at our conference this year. And our theme is 2020 and beyond. We're really delving into the profession. Uh, and, and so we've had so many conversations, but I, I really feel the last few months, our, our conversations have been critical. And what Lainey has shared with me has certainly opened my eyes into the profession and what's happening. So I'm not going to take a lot of time because we just have to get her on here <laughs> to share all her wisdom. So two logistics. Number one, the learning session will be about 40 minutes. And then we're going to open it for questions because I'm sure you're going to have a lot of questions for her today. You can submit your questions anytime during the webinar. And if you look in the lower right hand corner by the chat there, um, you can actually click on an icon or somehow identify that you have a question. And that will help Malia pull your questions aside. So then later we can go through those quickly. If you have any technical issues, the only support we can give you is through the chat. So let us know. We have someone who is taking care of that. And we will send a replay link after the webinar. So let me briefly tell you about Lainey and then she'll expand on her expertise. Lainey Miller is the founder and president of EA Search LLC a premier search firm specializing in senior level executive support. With over 30 years of experience and a passionate mission for finding the right support staff for individuals and leaders in all industries, Lainey's high rate of success reflects her many years of expertise and effective assessment and matching of senior executive management with the most effective support staff. She's also written a book, something she's very, very passionate about called Finding the Right Work. So welcome, Lainey. No, Joan. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Joan. Um, your enthusiasm is so contagious. I just always love being with you and am continuously inspired. Um, <laughs> yes, um, I'm Lainey Miller. Um, I'm the founder and the CEO of EA Search. Just to tell you quickly, EA Search is a retained search firm, which means we do a lot of consulting along with recruiting. And we specialize exclusively in senior level executive support um, for CEOs, high profile individuals, and um, uh, very uh, high net worth people. So our role is really that of being a very sophisticated matchmaker at the highest level of executive and personal assistance. And it is a wonderful, wonderful thing that I feel because I many times can't believe I get paid to do this because I really love making those matches. I know how important the right support is for everybody, but especially for our leaders, especially for our people who are really 
operating at a complex lifestyle and business level. Um, I just completed an article for the San Francisco Business Times, and I called it the secret sauce of executive success. And guess who that is? It's you. Um, because the, the most successful executives have the most efficient and, um, and highest level of support teams in their offices. So at any rate, I'm here to um, share time with Joan and with you. I'm going to look forward to answering a lot of questions. Good. But I want to say ahead of time, my biggest reason to be here is to tell you that all of us have endured probably more anxiety in life and in business in the last four or five months than many people have in a lifetime. So you're not alone in your anxiety, um, whether it's your boss or it's Joan and I, uh, or it's um, you know uh, your hairdresser who can't do any work. All of us are in the same anxiety-ridden ridden bucket. So I'm here to tell you that I believe there has never been more opportunity for the executive support profession to grab and grow the profession than right now. So my message is going to be that I'm going to beat that drum and talk to you about why it is the most hopeful and opportunistic time, really, that we may have had as a profession. So that's my message, and I'll let Joan um, move ahead with questions. I you here, I know, and and I. I have it all written down, the five key areas we want to talk about, but I also have a lot of notes. <laughs> and oh my gosh, so we, we've got to get going. So we're going to get started. We're going to let it flow. And, uh, so the first thing actually is, is kind of what you were leading to, Lainey, and you've said to me several times um, this that assistants really need to seize the opportunity right now in our background conversations have been like we're with so many assistants working from home and some of them feeling left out their executives not including them others are being highly leveraged and, and not knowing where this is all gonna fall out so can you really build on that about why you feel so strongly this is the opportunity and in what areas do they need to take advantage such as you said listening and communications and the virtual relationship. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a, it's really been interesting to me to watch. I have clients on, with whom I'm very close, and one in particular uh, where we've placed the six members of their senior team for their senior people. Um, but what I've noticed is that the team itself has become closer, and that's because they have daily Zoom meetings together. And it, when they were in the big fancy offices on the top of the Salesforce building, they were on two different floors. They didn't see each other all the time. So one of the silver linings for that particular team has been they have stayed in close touch and they feel more connected than they ever did. But the other uh, feedback that I'm getting from not only from them, but from others that I've talked to is the virtual relationship affords the possibility of creating a true partnership with the executive. Um, and how does that happen? How that happens is that the executive often doesn't know what you do for them. So what this affords is the opportunity for you to ask more and more questions proactively about their business goals, about what's on their plate, about what's needed. And within the leadership, uh, capacity that that has inspired in your way of being with them, you will notice that the, the relationship becomes less of a hierarchy and more of a partnership. So that's the biggest potential is that the role itself can become more and more of a partnership rather than a reactive executive assistant. It's a proactive, perhaps even executive business partner. And the executive business partner title is something that has been coined by Google here on the West Coast. And they created that because they didn't want there to be a hierarchical relationship between their executives and their assistants. Wow. So, so it is a role uh, title that we're hearing more and more in our search practice. And it's, it's a hybrid role, 
really between a chief of staff and a high level EA to CEO. Um, and these are the people making the six figures and these are the people leading the profession. So I believe that all of you who are working virtually are being given the opportunity to move and leverage your role into a partnership role in spite of, but because of not being in the office. So, so um, can, and can you build on that with some specific tips for them? Because I know, um, like you said, maybe that, you know, the daily communications or, you know, having that five minute, you know, I'm big on a five minute daily huddle with your executive, whether by phone or by Zoom or even on the phone. I know with my group, when we were working from home, I wanted to do FaceTime with them because I wanted to see their face. I didn't want to just talk right. on the phone. But right. what about, I know what some of them are going to already ask you, Lainey. My executive doesn't respond to my emails as it is. Uh, they don't acknowledge me. How do I actually get their attention? You know, that's always the question in any relationship, right? <laughs> well, even if we're in the office. <laughs> but I have a motto. I have a, a, a motto. I always say the pain of the present has to get bigger than people's resistance to change. Wow. Well, can you say that again? I know they're going to want to write that down. The and pain I do. of the present, which is, this is, I'm talking about the executive. For the executive, the pain of the present has to get bigger than his or her resistance to change. So what I mean is the habit of not wanting to talk to their assistant or the habit of not feeling as though that's valuable time spent. Um, the pain of not getting the support they need has to get bigger mm -hmm. than their resistance to following your orders, so to speak, or, mm -hmm. or your requests. Um, so one of the most critical pieces of virtual support is communication. And I think Joan sent you our uh, practices that we wrote for great virtual support. And the first one is communication and that's no accident because it's up to you as the professional to learn to communicate very strongly. And in a way, of course, that's gracious and in a way, of course, that's uh, that's comfortable for that executive to hear. But there has to be a certain amount of communication that is a request that cannot be ignored. And daily or weekly communication, depending on how long you've known the person, has to happen or you cannot do your jobs virtually. Because you, when you were in the office, they could walk in and you'd know what kind of mood they were in or you'd overhear phone conversations, or you'd know this, or you'd know that. All of that information is gone. So you will be completely in the dark unless you request information or unless you have a highly communicative executive, which is rare. I mean, because they have so much going on, you know, the squeaky wheel will always get the grease. Uh, so I would say, Joan, in answer to your questions, communication, communication, communication. And each executive is different and each assistant is different in terms of their styles and what they're capable of doing. But uh, you have to somehow have consistent communication where you can have the courage and the confidence to ask the questions you need to be able to leverage your support of that person. Your only goal is to make that person's work and life easier, to make their work more productive and less stressful but you have to get the information you need in order to do that. The hardest thing in the world is when somebody starts a job in these times and they haven't spent any face time with that person. Um, and we've had situations which I will talk more about at Joan's conference where we had one scenario where the, where the person did it in a way that worked for the communication and another didn't. And the two end stories of that um, and what happened. But number one is communication uh, in terms of requesting information that you need to support that person. And the other thing is um, to constantly be looking within that communication for needs that can be filled um, that are really strategic in nature 
such that you're thinking ahead enough in your questioning to know that this person is going to be needing three weeks from now something along the lines of a project, blah, blah, blah. And you're helping that person to stay on track with their timeline. Now, they didn't ask you to do that, but you're doing that. And that's called strategic support, right? So I think being proactive, being strategic, and that communication, and also asking the hard questions like, what do you need from me that I'm not giving you? That's always hard because you like to think you're giving them everything, right? But what do you need from me that I'm not giving you? So the more communication you can do and the more um, strategic thinking, proactive thinking, thinking out of the box, creativity rules right now, innovation rules. The old way of working doesn't work anymore. In my business, in Joan's business, in your business, in everybody's business. So I think the important thing to know is that everybody is anxious, but there is great opportunity in chaos. And we're at the peak of a wave of change where there is a lot of opportunity for each of us to have creativity and ways of working that we had never considered before. But in many ways, you have to be the leader in that relationship for your executive. Um, so it's, it's a blessing and a curse in a way, but the blessing is that you can be the one that then moves up in value for that executive in a way that will uh, benefit you relative to your, uh, your career, but also be of great benefit to him or her. Gosh, this is so, so good. I'm taking all my notes to enjoy. <laughs> I feel like we really needed two hours today, like <laughs> Um, because right each of these facets you're mentioning, we could expand upon right. uh, or expand on, and, you know, just that one piece with the communications. I mean, I always say it's the words a person uses. I'm always, you know, trying to emphasize with assistance, one word could change the whole thing. And so, because sometimes assistants will wonder, well, why does that assistant always seem to get what she needs or wants? Well, how is she saying it? What is she saying? Is she using persuasion skills? I mean, there, it's very deep, right? Mm -hmm. um, and you also said, um, gosh, I'm making notes all over the place here. The I know when we were talking you with the communication piece, you told me the other day, listening, it needs to be amped up in a virtual relationship. Can you talk about the listening aspect? Uh, you know, listening is is an art and great assistants listen without thinking they know what they're going to hear. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, one of the biggest, I think, um, rabbit holes people get in is they think, oh, well, he always or she always says this or he always or she always does this. And and then they're kind of. Um, they're kind of midwifing the conversation into what they believe is going to happen. But in this day and age, you have an executive that has no idea as to what they're doing tomorrow. They don't have any idea when this is over. They don't have any, any way of replicating what they used to do. So listening becomes uniquely important at the level of opening your mind, not thinking you already know, even if you've been working for this executive for a year or more, don't assume, do not assume you know what they're going to say. So when you ask a question, you want to keep a beginner's mind, an open mind, and just really listen and let them finish their sentence. Don't think that you know already what the end of that sentence is going to be, which is hard for any of us, especially I think for those of us that love to interact with people. We think, you know, I'm always, my husband's always saying, let me finish. Let me finish. <laughs> so, <laughs> and sometimes, many times he says something I wasn't sure he's he was going to say. <laughs> but anyway, so, so you want to be really careful when you listen. Listen for not only the content, but listen for the way it's being said. Is it anxiety? Is the person kind of not knowing what to say, so they're filling up the sentence? You know, really try and get the 3D of what's being said and not think you know what, what is being said. You know, 
I read a book when email first came out and it said uh, that, that email is only 30% of the way human beings communicate. And what is that? That's content, right? It's just content. Mm -hmm. And the other 70% um, is our facial expressions. It's the way we're looking in our eyes. It's, you know, what we're doing with our hair, you know, all of it. So we've been stripped now of, you know, a good high percentage of the way human beings communicate um, by being virtual. So what does that mean? That means you're listening when you're listening and hopefully you're Zooming or FaceTiming with your executives and not just on the phone. But, but even so, you're not there with them getting that energetic information that you do. So listening becomes critical. Yeah, I love that you included the the whole body part of it, and that's why I'm really. I always talked about human moments for 30 years. I always told the assistants, you have to have human moments. You have to have the face to face, five, even if it's five minutes in the morning. But now it's more important than ever. Get and it's amazing how many people a whole other subject Zoom don't want to put their faces up, even when I'm doing a, a webinar training session. You know, it's like, put your face up. I mean, the visual is so important, our expressions, right, and all of it. So, again, that's that's a whole other lesson. And we're going to move on. So someone had asked earlier, what were the five topics we were going to speak on? So really quick, and we'll move on to the second one. But the first one we had on our marketing piece was seizing the opportunity. Second is focusing on taking a leadership role, which... A uh, lady did talk about briefly. We'll talk touch on that a little more. Uh, the pro at number three, proactively and strategically adding value. I think that's very important. Number four, she touched on kind of right now a little bit the transparent and consistent communication. So that was kind of weaved in with our number one, and then uh, the fifth one has to do with the soft skills being more important than ever. So let's go back a minute to number two. Um, can you expand a little bit on, on how they could take take more of that leadership role right now during these times and what, what does that look like? Yeah, yeah, you know, um, I, guess the, I guess the easiest way to say it is that, um, in many ways, executive assistants have always led the relationships with their executives. You know, we always say that a good executive can train an executive in being supported at the level that he doesn't know or she doesn't know she she's she she can have. So, in other words, really strong assistants who are at the top of their game have the capacity to go into a CEO, even who hasn't ever been supported properly and train them in being supported. So that takes leadership. What does that mean? Leadership is a strength that can be cultivated. You're not a natural leader necessarily. It can be cultivated. But one of the ingredients that's critical is honesty. It's direct communication. It's not being afraid to push back and not being afraid to make mistakes. So all of those things are probably present in the people you're supporting, but they're even more present, in my opinion, in high-level executive business partners and executive assistants. They are really, um, they are really uh, qualities required to virtually lead the relationship. So let's just start with communication. So the ability to somehow request and receive uh, enough communication back from an executive so that you know how to support them most effectively really requires you to have the courage to communicate honestly and directly. And that's not easy for some people. I mean, I'm a people pleaser and I, it's been hard all my life to really be direct with people if I think it might offend them or 
hurt their feelings. But frankly, this is a time when however your style works in the relationship, you can't really afford to be um, shy or in any way non-transparent in your communication. So, so number one is communication, but the other is um, the ability to create processes and systems that work in the virtual relationship. You know, the way you used to support that person in the office is going to be different than now. So I think in terms of leadership, you are going to be the one called to really create the communication in such a way that there is direct and open communication, number one. And number two, because you're in a support role, you want to create processes that work for your executive, but they're, they may well be different than the ones you had in the office. And you're going to need to get buy-in from the executive for those processes. These are both leadership uh, roles that are required. Uh, but I think the biggest thing of all is the ability to understand what your leader is going through in terms of the anxiety and the not knowing so that you can support really almost as a thought leader some of the anxiety that he or she is having. And you can't do that unless you require some level of communication on a daily or weekly basis. Mm -hmm. But the leadership role is really just realizing the power you have to create support through your training of that executive as to how to best use you. Excellent, thank you. Um, so going to our third topic, and I'm seeing some really good comments and there will be a lot of questions for you. Um, the number three, proactively and strategically adding value. And I, I'd also like us to touch on Lainey. I know we've been focusing a lot on so many assistants working from home, um, but I've also been talking, you know, with some of the assistants I know well that are at high levels now and going back to their offices. And of course, that's a very different situation as well. They have like 20% of the workforce back. Everything feels weird and strange. And, and their executives have just, you know, the weight of the world on their shoulders. So could we address that or could you address that? Um, you know, kind of in both arenas, if you're back at work, because it's going to be different, right? I mean, that your workplace isn't what it was in January. And then I know it doesn't matter wherever you work, right? Whether you're virtual or not virtual as an assistant, I should be adding strategic value. I don't know if people really understand what that means. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Can you explain that? Okay, well, let's just start with strategic value and then we'll go into the workplace. But strategic value is different for each industry, for each executive. You know, for somebody in private equity, um, strategic value might mean um, really staying closely aware of the deals on that person's plate and being able to you know, schedule uh, people according to how important and how close to filling or, or uh, completing the deal your, your executive is. So that might be strategic because you're aware that he needs to see Mary more importantly than he needs to see Jim just based on the deal flow. So that's a strategic, oh, okay. a strategic way of looking. Now, if you happen to work for uh let's say a CEO uh, in, you know, of a global company uh, who's really, you know, got all kinds of meetings across continents and across time zones, you know, and is, is really overburdened with the amount of work he, ha he or she has, you know, you're trying to strategically save that person time for creativity. So you're not scheduling those meetings back to back just because, just because. So you know enough about the burden that that CEO has on his plate to be able to say, you know, I scheduled 20 minutes for you to just sit and meditate or think or do whatever. That's a strategic act that he didn't think of and he wouldn't have asked for or she. 
So, uh, so strategy comes uh, in many different forms, but it always means that you're doing things above and beyond what the person expects relative to saving them time, increasing productivity, or uh, increasing uh, peace of mind. You know, those are things that if you function strategically, and sometimes it might be as little as running a, a sandwich into somebody's office because you know they haven't eaten all day. I mean, that's, that could be, you know, that could be a strategic move. Very, very different level than perhaps thinking about the board meeting that's coming up in six months and starting to get working on that. Um, but you have to really realize that a lot of times executives have no idea as to what you possibly can do. And the only way uh, you can show them how is to get enough information so that you can move in a way that's above and beyond their expectations. So that's number one. But number two, in terms of where we work, that is like such a huge question, isn't it? Um, you know, I, I, I believe that the people that are back in the office have to be really present to just the moment. In other words, the flexibility required, like you walk in and nobody's there except a few people. So your first reaction is to go, this is weird. I don't like this. Well, yes, but everything's gonna be strange in the beginning. So if you can learn to manage your mind in a situation like that well enough to say, wait a minute, my, my job is to make my executive's job easier. My job is to support that person in any way I can. So really the only thing you can do in a, in a very uncomfortable situation like that is to manage your own mind's reaction. Uh, where are all the people? Well, they're, they're not there. Okay, let it go. Don't follow that thought, right? So, so, so it becomes for all of us in this day and age, we have to manage our own minds. And I do that by staying present to this day only. In other words, I, I can't think ahead the way I used to. I used to be able to plan six months ahead, but I don't know exactly what's going to be needed of me tomorrow, except for some projects that I'm working on. So I think that would be my answer to, you know, if you are in an office, be flexible, manage your own reactions to the, to the feeling of strangeness, and just put your focus right back on your executive. How do I, how can I help? That person's feeling weird too. Mm. So what can I do to, to, to ease that person? So the minute you take your mind off your own mind and start again thinking about your executive, you will be more comfortable. Very good. And I want to. I have another thought too. While you were talking, with, you know, in relation to this, um, there are many of you. I mean, we have wow, well, over fifteen hundred on this webinar right now. Um, and I know many, several thousand will watch the replay because of the registrations we got. So at some point, if you're not back at your office yet, you are going to go back to your office. I mean, whether it's two months from now, four months from now, six months from now. And the title of this webinar, you know, that Lainey had for us, the way we work is changing our you. So one thing I am passionate about talking about being proactive, I like assistance. I like you to be as proactive as you can and not be so reactive, although today we have to be very reactive. But the idea is, if you're not going back for a few months, what are you doing now, though, in these next few months to prepare yourself mentally for when you go back instead of waiting to the day you show up and now all there's this all this weirdness? Or what are you doing skill wise? You know, right, Lainey, to so I believe that in this time, don't think this is the time. Well, I'm just vegging out on, on the couch because I'm working from home and I'm not I, I don't have much to do. To me, this is a time, as you said, utilize this time, take advantage of this opportunity to prepare yourself. So when you go back in, you're ready to roll, because I know a lot of assistants have said when they go back in, there's going to be so much backlog. And, and rescheduling and doing all of this, right, Lainey? So what advice, what could assistants be doing right now if they are working from home, they're not you know, overwhelmed, how should they be preparing themselves? Because the day will come back that they're gonna go back, even if it's just two days a week, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, 
I read an article yesterday, Joan, that um, 82% of a certain number of leaders that were um, surveyed said that uh, there would be always be some level of virtual work as far as they were concerned. Mm -hmm. um, so, so whether it's part-time, full-time, two-thirds time, one-third time, you know, so, you know, how to prepare for whatever happens, whether all of a sudden you have to go back two days a week, or I, I understand some companies are doing mornings, some companies are doing, you know, separating it into mornings and afternoons, you know, but every, every company will do it differently. So what does that mean? And, and really your executives are having the same conversations we're having. So uh, what it means to me is that I can no longer uh, dictate exactly how I'm going to work. Um, and, you know, I, I think all of us, Joan and I were talking before you came, you know, we all like to have this illusion of control about our lives. That's a human condition. We always want to feel, oh, yes, I'm in charge. Um, but guess what? <laughs> Along came the virus. And, you know, uh, a certain number of years ago, along came the Great Depression in their time. Um, so we we actually don't have as much control as we think we do. So what does that mean? How do we prepare for the fact that we don't know what it's going to be like next year or next month? We just don't know. And you know, your executive is facing the same thing. So so how do we deal with that? I think the best way to deal with that is to amp up your ability to be flexible to amp up your ability to go with the flow, to amp up your awareness that any of us really um, are not in control of external events. The only thing we can control is our reaction to them. So the more you can control your minds and your reactions to external events, and the more you can make decisions to change old habits, and to move into new ways of working, whatever way you do that. Some people do, you know, they exercise more and they get more flexible. Some people, you know, meditate. Some people do um, certain, you know, uh, videos of how to change. Tony Robbins, you know, whatever it takes to, to strengthen your inner self with the ability to be flexible and to move in whatever direction is most helpful to the profession. Those are going to be the people that survive and thrive in this new world. And if you are in a place where you go, no, I always work this way or I always work that way, you know, it's not going to keep up for any of us. I mean, I can't do it either. I've been in the business for actually 40 plus years and I don't, I don't even begin to think I'm going to do my business the way I did last year or 10 years ago or 15 years ago. Because what I've seen is, I've seen that everything changes all the time. There used to be secretaries. Then along came word processors. Then along came computers, personal computers then after that. And then now we have artificial intelligence. But guess what? Every time there was a change, this profession changed itself and, and grew into something more and more valuable. And that's what we have to do. And the only way to do that is to be flexible, be open to change, and to become more and more strong in our sense of who we are as professionals. Very good. Um, and I know you know, this is going to be, um, we're going to have even more interesting conversations. So our, our live virtual conference is October 27th to the 30th. And, and I'll talk more about that at the end. And Lainey was gonna be speaking. We were gonna do the live event. Now it's just virtual, but we will be live. And Lainey, I, I can only imagine by October, you're gonna have a lot more new, new information to offer, you know, right? We've got three more months, whatever to go. And we're gonna have even more to talk about and more to talk in terms, you know, talk about in terms of how the profession is being impacted. Um, and, and the future and what we're seeing. And so it's going to be really interesting, right, when we connect again in October and we're talking to the assistants out there and what we're going to be 
also talking about at that time. So I'm going to go to questions because I know there's a lot of questions and I would like to get in as many as we can today. So Malia, we'll wait for Malia to come on. Um, all right, Malia, go ahead. I'll let you read the, you could go ahead and read the question. Okay, we have, we have plenty of questions for you. <laughs> um, <laughs> okay, Jody would like to know, how can you gain the momentum if your executive is going elsewhere and she is not on site all the time? How do you gave, gain momentum if your executive is not on site? Gain momentum in terms of support, I imagine she's saying. I'm assuming. Um, gain momentum when the- She's um, saying she's not always on site. Oh, when she's not always on site, okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, I think again, it goes back to the innovation and um, focus on what communication is needed um, with that executive. And not being on site just means there has to be more, uh, whether it's texting, email, or phone, or Zoom, there has to be an amping up of communication. I mean, that's what we talked about earlier. Um, it has, communication has to be the responsibility, um, your responsibility to make it happen. Um, because that executive is not gonna be proactive about communicating as a rule. Just keep that in mind. And it doesn't mean they don't like you or they don't want to talk to you, but they've got too much else that they're thinking about. So it has to be your responsibility to proactively create the kind of commu communication that executive is comfortable with, but it has to be a lot. Okay. Um, Jean, thank you, by the way, Lainey. Uh, Jean says, my executive says, quote, make me better, support at a higher level. However, they don't tell her what areas. I've asked and I get general a general answer, oh, just keep me on track, but they don't share information and they won't keep me in the loop. I finally begged for weekly huddles and finally got them, but no help. How do you support or keep on track when they won't identify which areas? Right, that's such a good question. That's one of my favorite questions uh, to to answer, um, when I interview a CEO uh, to determine uh, what her or his needs are, I'm going to just say her and then his. I'll just go back and forth. Yeah. Um, I would never ever ask a CEO what I can do to help or 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 what do they need. Tell me what you need. I would never never ask that question because they would look at me like they were a deer in the headlights. They don't know how to say it. They don't know. So what do I do? I ask them questions. Um, that are that are really related to things they can answer. So, for example, I would say, tell me more about where you believe you're wasting the most time every day. When you go home and shake your head and say, I can't believe how much time I wasted, blah, 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 blah. That's a question. You know, tell me what is the strongest, biggest thing in your mind over the next six months? What are you really thinking about? You know, what... Um, at this point in time, are you worried about? Is there something coming up that you're worried about? Um, questions have to be pointed at where their pain points are so that you begin to see where you can be of help because they will not be able to tell you. They don't really know what you do enough. And more importantly, they don't know what you're capable of doing. So in order to really amp up your value, you have to ask enough questions. And this is where I mean about transparency and being direct. It's not easy to ask people, like I even ask people what their biggest, um, what their biggest weakness is. I'll ask a CEO that, what's your biggest weakness? And they know, that's my biggest weakness. I can't do this or I can't do that. Or I'll say, what do the people closest to you uh, say is your biggest strength as a leader? So we know that, you know, but you never wanna, you don't, you, you don't wanna ever expect them to tell you what they need. That's if I if you don't remember anything else I've said, you have to ask the questions necessary to get the information uh, so that you know how to support the person. And uh, to build on that with Lenny, I, I'm so glad you um, actually scripted 
verbiage because I know assistants really struggle, like what are the exact words I use, right? Um, and there was a really good book I that was going around corporate America oh, way, way back. I don't know if you ever heard of it. It was QBQ, so the question before the question. And the premise of the book was the reason why we don't get the answers we want sometimes is because we didn't ask the right question. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I think it's that same example, right? I could say, oh, do you have anything I could help you with today? Well, the quick answer is, oh, no, I'm fine, right? Mm -hmm. said if you change the question you'll probably get a different answer i remember one assistant said to me years ago that made me think differently is how can i get that started for you mm -hmm. so instead of saying can i help you with that which i could have said oh no that's all right when she said how can i start that for you how can i get that started all of a sudden my thinking changed and i came up with an answer so i i think this is a really good point yeah let me just let me just interrupt you just for a minute so no. I don't but I remember I had an executive tell me once, Lini, find me somebody who will support me in the way I need to be supported, not in the way she wants to support me. Ah, that's really insightful. And 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 it's really true because sometimes there's a sense that all sizes you know, fit one person and they don't. So a big thing that a really top level assistant does is they're almost a chameleon in terms of their type of support that they give the person. They learn the person. And learning people is harder when it's virtual and you just have to accept that. Very good. Um, so I, I don't know, the camera's getting weird all of a sudden, yeah, you're fine, but you're getting grainy, not your fault, that's webinar jam. So if anybody else has seen that for right now, just hang in there because it hopefully will just switch back. But as long as you could hear her as well. Um, all right, the next question. Certainly, uh, Claudia wants to know, how do you grow the relation? How do you grow the relation to the next level with your executive? when you're working remotely, not COVID related. I've been working remotely with him for two years now. He's based in France, I'm in Canada. We used to have face-to-face -face meetings three to four times per year, but now with COVID, it's less than that. Yeah, boy, that is, a, that is you know, but it's, it's no different than if if she were these days, if she were in San Francisco and, and the person was sitting where I'm sitting in Sausalito, I mean, that distance has become shorter and the virtual relationship is the virtual relationship. So the answer to the question really is um, back to beginning to uh, understand the business of the business. So she's been supporting, or I'll just speak, it's, it's Claudia, right? Yes. So Claudia, um, you've been supporting this person for two years. That person's job has changed dramatically in two years. So the question I would ask myself if I were you is, do I know what this person's job is right now? What are they doing? What's on their plate? What is the business of the business they're doing? Um, so if I were you, I would ask for a meeting with this person on Zoom, and I would say, I want to reboot our relationship. It's been two years, and you've changed, and I've changed, and, and the way I support you has uh, pretty much stayed the same, but, but I feel like I want to contribute more to you, so I want a meeting with you. And in that meeting, I would have a list of questions that really have to do with understanding, you know, what, in fact, I'd be happy to send you a sort of redacted copy of what I asked my executives, if you'd like it, um, so that you have a template. Uh, but at any rate, you know, what, it, what, are you, what are you primarily involved with? What do you plan to do over the next six months in terms of your work? Any questions you can ask to have an understanding of what's on his plate and will allow you to better help him strategically. And of course, don't ask the question, how can I help you? <laughs> <laughs> that was very good. Okay, Lainey, Marjorie wants to know if you have any advice to manage executive support and homeschooling. Schools are not reopening in California next month. 
Wow, you know, that is such a big subject. And, you know, uh, I have a friend who consults for senior executives in Silicon Valley, and they just got there, and it's a huge global tech company, and she's coaching the CEO and the C-level executive. And they just did a survey for all of their employees to see how they were doing. And the people that came back with the most stress were the people who had who had two jobs in the family, the, both, both parents were working, and the children were ages 11 and under. So uh, Marjorie, I don't know how old your children are, but if, if they are 11 and under, you're in the most stressed group of all, according to my friend. Um, so, you know, for me, I, and, and you may have already done this, um, but, you know, we, we used to live in a culture where being parents and being a worker were separated. And right now, uh, they're integrated, which has its silver lining, but it also has a real challenge. Um, but I would say that the most important thing you could do is talk to your employer and let them know that between the hours of X and Y, you are going to be homeschooling. You plan to make up that time at a different time when the children are asleep or when the children are, uh, you know, being um, entertained by something else, but that you're not going to be available for work during those hours because the stress is created by thinking you have to do both at once and then you don't do either one to your satisfaction, right? I would imagine. Uh, so the big thing is, again, communication. I need you to know that my hours are going to be this and that. And if there's something urgent, always feel free to text me and I will get back to you as quickly as possible. But, you know, these are the hours I'm going to be available for my children and these are the hours I'm going to be available for you. So if that doesn't work for you, let me know and I'll try and make other arrangements. But somehow get yourself in a place when you're with those children, you're with those children, and when you're with your job, you're with your job. Otherwise, it's, it's really chaotic. Yeah. I agree with that. I think that's where the communication, the setting healthy boundaries, you've got to set boundaries both, you know, and I was a working mother. I mean, when my kids were little and I didn't work from home, but the thing is I did still set boundaries even with my children. So I think it's, you know, depending on what age your children are, they also have to understand you just can't run in any time they want into mommy's office or workspace. So I feel you, you still also have to teach your children too. Now, if they're two or three, they're not going to get it. But, it, you know, like they're my grandchildren's age, 9, 10, 11, 12. I mean, when Brian was working from home a lot, he told the kids, look, from 8 to 5, I'm in the bedroom. I'm doing this. That's where his office was set up. And, you know, I, it's, I'm not here, basically, you know. So I think it's that combination, right, in determining what those boundaries are that have to be set that are going to work from you. I mean, maybe you're going to be really productive from 7 a.m. until 3 p.m. So you're still putting in maybe the same hours, you know, and then you're going to school the kids or, yeah. And But that's where, again, Lainey, right, they've got to, you've got to communicate with your executive. You have to come to terms in an agreement. And the other idea I wanted to throw out when you were talking about the other question and the virtual working from home all the time, um, I did work with a, an executive and his assistant this year and they're all the time, even when they're in their office, her physical office is in a whole other building on the campus. But what they do is they purposely set time aside, maybe it's two times a month or every week, I don't know if it was one day a week, where they purposely physically go get together and meet. So just because you're working from home virtually doesn't mean you can't go have coffee at Starbucks together. I mean, that's what I would do. Or I would say, tell, tell me, exactly, let's go meet and let's have a lunch meeting. You know, so just because you're working from home, it doesn't mean, and you can't maybe go back to your office, it doesn't mean you can't meet those somewhere else. So this is, again, where Lainey was saying, you have to be creative right now. You have to be innovative. You have to look for other ways. You have to look for ways of working differently. So then those were all the, the main points Lainey was bringing out early in our webinar today. 
So, um, all right, another question. I think we have time for one more, maybe, Malia, depending on how lengthy it is. Okay. Um, Vanessa says, my executive needs con needs constant reminding. Sorting out things prior to deadlines isn't her best act. How do I help her with that? Because constant reminding hasn't done as much as I would wish. Ah, you know, this sounds like it might have a technological answer. <laughs> um, you know, uh, I, I can't, I, if I could speak with Vanessa, I would say, well, I assume you've tried uh, creating a text 10 minutes before the call or 10 minutes before the event. I assume, because text certainly is a way that most of us get, it gets our attention right away because we've got that phone in our hand, right? But assuming that the texting didn't work, I think what you have to do is have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with the person and say, look, nothing's worked. Um, I would like to research uh, uh, an app for your phone that will allow you to be reminded um, at a level that is tolerant for you and that you'll that you'll respond to. And if I can find such a thing, would you let me put it on your put it on your calendar? I mean, that's the only thing I can figure out because most people that I talk to at a high level have an arrangement with their executive, and they create that arrangement early on and say, "Okay, if I do this, I know you'll look at it." Okay, so, and I'm not going to do this unless you have to look at it. So what you want to do is create some system. And if you've been texting 15 minutes before the appointment or whatever it is, and they're still not responding, then, then for whatever reason, that doesn't work, right? So then I would, I would say, I need to have a one-on-one -on -one with you, and we need to talk about the reminding system that I need to create for you. And don't make it, don't make that person wrong. Don't make your executive wrong for not responding, but rather saying, I'm really excited to find a solution for this challenge. So let's have a talk about what isn't working, and then I'm going to figure out what will work. And then you have to go do that. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Uh, so a couple of things for stay on if you can, everyone. So there's just a couple of things. We'll try to add another question in here. If any of you could stay on like maybe two or three minutes extra, we'll take another question. But if you have to uh, leave us, there's two things I want to be sure to mention. One, well, first of all, Lainey, we're going to give away two copies of your book. So her book is, again, Finding the finding Right Work. Um, so Malia, can you tell us who the two winners are? And then the book will be coming directly from Lainey. I can. I have Terry Hall yeah. and Terry Lori Goldsmith. Lori, yay, congratulations. So Malia will get you their names and information. So yeah, very, very exciting. But if you didn't win, you could certainly um, look up Lainey's book. And Lainey, you told me the other day that there's a website just for the book, or would you rather they go to the your EA search? Well, either way, there is a, it's easier to remember findingrightwork.com. But if you go to easearch.com, there is a link to the book. And it's a pretty interesting website in terms of resources as well. So easearch.com or findingrightwork.com. And the whole title, Finding Right Work, the five steps to a life you love. And uh, it's, it's a, I think, a book uh, that you would enjoy reading. Even if you love your profession, uh, there are always ways to make it better. Mm -hmm. All right. And then let's see the other announcement, and then we'll take another question. Um, again, if you could stay on, we're good for a couple more minutes. Uh, so as I mentioned, our annual conference for administrative excellence will be offered virtual this year, live virtual. Um, we did move our live in-person event to next year. We'll be announcing those dates soon. But it's a, it's, we're going to have so many amazing presenters. In addition to Lainey, um, we have Lisa, Lucy Brazier, who's amazing. Um, she's going to be sharing with us a lot about what she's seen globally in the profession and actually how they're trying
trying to move toward uh, titles that are levels for assistance that'll be recognized all over the world. We're going to really dig into your career, you know, specifically getting into the meat, how important your digital profiles are going to be now more so than ever. Um, how do you really show your value? What are we expecting for the future in this profession? So, and we've we've made it very cost effective for you because we know you're all watching this year. So it's three hundred and ninety five dollars for the two and a half days. Um, and we have a really cool platform um, that you're going to be able to network live with people all over the world. There's a networking room. There's an exhibit hall. So some really cool stuff. And we're going to add some fun activities and possibly a little entertainment even. And if you sign up between July 16th and July 24th, you will receive four of my micro webinars for free. And the four are decision making for assistance, setting healthy boundaries, be business savvy, and setting yourself apart. All right. Uh, and I believe, and you can go to officedynamicsconference.com to get your ticket. Okay, do you want to do one more question, Lainey? Are you up for one more? Sure. Okay, one more. <laughs> Pardon me. Um, Lisa says, admins of all levels are working longer. What would you say to older executive slash senior level admins on competing for positions in this day and age? Especially since we got into the industry, degrees were not always required. Uh, that's a great question too. I, I, you know, all of us, because we grew up in this country, have issues around aging and around, you know, you know, am I getting too old? Am I doing, you know, it's just, it's just the culture. And what I say to them is this, with the experience that you have under your belt, people who are right out of school with those degrees could not possibly compete with you. Um, you are going to be applying for jobs that you will get and be able to do because of your experience. And frankly, if, if I have a search and somebody says, we need a degree, I'll say, okay, tell me why. And you can always push back if somebody says, well, you don't have a degree. Tell me why you need a degree. Well, they'll say, I want problem solving. I want really good written communication. I want good organizational skills. I want research skills. I want, And you, I'm sure, have those in spades. So don't be intimidated by the number of years of experience you have. And don't be intimidated by not having a degree. The truth is, your commitment to lifelong learning is much more valuable than a degree in many ways. Wow, that's really, really good. I love that. What a great way to end, right? Yeah. <laughs> Lanny, can you please repeat the title of your book and your website? Okay, it's Finding Right Work, Five Steps to a Life You Love. And the website for the book is findingrightwork.com. And you just click on the butterfly and then it'll take you to Amazon very quickly. <laughs> and then uh, they can also go to easearch.com and then there is a link to the book on the website. Perfect. Thank you. All right. Well, wow. I, I think we had a really, really good uh, um, session today. We still have 1,100 people sitting on with us. So that's, that's amazing. Um, and I just want to thank you again, Lainey, for all your time, your knowledge, your inspiration for loving and supporting this profession and doing what you do. I really, really can't wait till we do this again in October, but you're going to be presenting by yourself in October. Okay. Then, but <laughs> you'll be good because you'll have all that time to share all your knowledge. Yeah. Um, and we certainly hope to see many of you at our virtual event. So. Thank you all so much for your time today. And um, we hope you've left, we've left you with some wonderful inspiration and, and hope and opportunities. So thank yeah, you. Joan, I'll thank chat you. with you soon. I want to say, Joan, thank you for all you yeah. do for the profession and for having me. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. I'll Bye. talk to you soon. Take Lainey, care. Lainey, if you could, please, <laughs> Lainey, please stay on. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to end, but please stay on, Lainey. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye, everyone.